Uh, let's talk about uh, pituitary adenomas. So pituitary adenomas are bending tumors of the pituitary gland. Um, most common hormone secreting uh, pituitary tumor types over secrete a uh, prolactin or stomatotropin, uh, which is a growth hormone. Horm hormone. Um, uh, and this last one, the stomatotropin, causes a acromegaly, right? Um, which refers basically to the excessive uh, linear growth that occurs as a result um, of this uh, over secretion uh, when epiphyseal growth plates uh, are still open. So the acromegaly has a lot of um, severe symptoms that will um, um, develop later in in life of the of the, of the patients, uh, including cardiac man, um, cardiac manifestations and all of this. So uh, this condition is kind of difficult to diagnose uh, early in the life. Uh, this is why um, some people are trying to investigate more about the genet uh, the possible genetic predisposition in this type of tumors. In general, the genetic predisposition of, um, in this type, in the pituitary adenomas specifically, uh, is considered uh, uncommon. Wait, okay. Um, but no, no, no. <laughs> not yet, not yet. <laughs> okay. Um, but in this paper, they talk about a previously uncharacterized form of low penetrant uh, pituitary adenoma predisposition, uh, which is called a P by the um, acronym. PAP that could contribute to the disease burden, specifically in northern Finland. Um, let's remember what is a low penetrans gene, first of all. Um, and a low penetrans gene is a well, first, when we talk about penetrans, uh, we have to remember that penetrans is defined as a fraction of individuals of a given genotype who uh, have the expected phenotype. So low penetrance gene is a hereditary predisposition that could lead to um, an actual disease, but may cause more effect on population than high penetrance disease susceptibility. Okay, so our, um, the next slide. Yeah. Um, okay, so with this purpose, three clusters of familial pituitary adenoma were detected, as I said before, in northern Finland, and later studied. Two of, he, of these clusters uh, could be linked by geneal, genealogy, and the third was separated from the two others. And this is what we can see in this slide. Uh, we see pedigrees of two families separated, family one and family two. Um, okay, and... 11 affected individuals in family one were identified by the, you can see uh, who were in, in like affected by the laying, by the symbols that are right there. Um, the pituitary adenoma predisposition phenotype didn't really appear to fit in any of the known familiar pituitary adenoma syndromes previously described. So uh, this led the investigators to think more about the PAP um, mm -hmm. gene. So we have, what's the, what's the next step here? The next step here is to identify the PAP locus, okay? The pituitary adenoma predisposition locus. And in order to do this, um, they perform um, whole genome single, single nucleotide polymorphism genotyping for 16 individuals from family one. Um, oh, and before obtaining any linkage information, they made two analyses. Okay, okay. Um, the first one is considering a, only, as affected, only individuals with acromegaly or gigantism. Um, And the other consider individuals with 
any pituitary adenoma as affected. So the first one, the first um, group of people, the first uh, is considered as high stringency, and the second one is considered as low stringency. Um, high stringency conditions are used to detect identical or very highly concerned genomic sequences complementary to the probe sequence, okay? And the low stringency conditions um, enable the hybrid, hybrid, enable to uh, identify less homologous nucleate acid, acid sequences. Um, okay, and they did this because the number of phenocopies for acromegaly and gigantism or, um, is much lower than the prolactinoma. What is a phenocopy? Uh, a phenocopy is a non-heritable uh, em environmentally induced phenotype that is analogous to a genotype determined by determined phenotype in another person. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, uh, let's talk about um What's next? <laughs> then, after this two an this analysis, uh, they found evidence for a linkage in chromosome uh, 11q12, um, 11q13. Um, and let's see what they knew before finding uh, the evidence. And is that this region specifically has been previously implicated in isolated familial somatotropinoma and including the MEN1 gene, and is, which is not, de not detected in the sample set. Okay, and the next thing is to find the correct uh, locus. So uh, for doing this, they um, used 36 markers in families one and two, and the added maximum logarithm of the odd score for both families was um, 7.1. And both families shared the linked haplotype, um, which segregated, segregated for acromegaly. And this last thing uh, is the one that made it clear that uh, the locus identification was made in the correct way. And just to finish, the linked region harbored uh, 295 genes. Okay, which uh, brings it to me. So once they identified the PAP loci, um, they wanted to look at genes with aberrant expression, so genes that had mutations within that loci. Um, so they obtained expression profiles for 16 individuals, um, including nine PAP carriers from both families one and two and seven controls. And the way they went by this is they used 172 probe sets and um, each of those probe sets represented a gene. And essentially a probe set is a short DNA sequence that is complementary to the um, transcri transcript of target essentially, and it's going to hybridize with it. Um, and that's one way to figure out which nucleotide is mutated or um, or which nucleotides are mutated. So they found the two lowest p-values for the mutations obtained, and these two uh, p-values both corresponded to um, two different probe sets, but both which, um, but they were both representing the AIP gene. Um, so this led to AIP gene being chosen as a candidate for mutation analysis. Um, they also chose Galactin-12, which was also based on um, decreased expression and just prior association with Galactin-3 and pituitary tumorogenesis. Um, they also found that there was no difference in MEN1 expression, um, like Martha had previously talked about. It's a gene that if it typically carries or if it carries a germline mutation, um, it's indicated in a lot of in multiple endocrine neoplasias, so they found um, no difference in expression among these samples. Um, so within 
looking into this AIP gene, they found a nonsense mutation where glutamine was replaced with a chain terminating codon. Um, and they found that this segregated with the somatotropinomas found, um, somatotropinoma phenotype found in families one and two. Um, and they also, um, they also had a control, which was um, 209 local blood donors, and they found that this mutation was absent. Um, so this mutation indeed was conserved to the AIP gene um, and found in individuals with somatotropinomas. They also carried out a similar analysis with Galactin-12, um, and they found no differences between the control, the local blood donors and the sample. You have about four minutes, by the way. Okay. So uh, they wanted to evaluate the AIP, the AIP genes contribution in earlier population-based cohort studies that they had, um, that they had carried out. And this was consisting of 54 patients diagnosed with somatotropinomas between 1980 and 1999. So DNA was available from like 45 out of the 54 acromegaly patients. Um, which included four cases from families one and two. So six out of 45 patients displayed this mutation. Um, and one patient displayed a mutation from like a splice in a splice site. Um, and for that specific mutation, they uh, screened 219 local blood donors, um, which was, and they found that it was negative. It wasn't in them. Um, they also compare the age at diagnosis, sex, and, and the size of the adenoma compared between um, the PA group with predisposition and PA patients that didn't have the AIP mutation, and they found no difference in tumor size or sex distribution. Um, and they also found that PAP patients were significantly younger than um, mutation negative patients. So this kind of indicated it, a young age of onset is a useful indicator um, since 16, six out of the 15 patients that were diagnosed uh, at, under the age of 35 with a PA all had P, like they were um, predisposed. They had the PAP loci. Um, they also screened 10 unselected Finnish sporadic acromegaly patients, and they also found uh, two of them had the Q14X mutation. Um, they also carried out a loss of heterozygosity analysis, uh, which is a technique to identify lost genetic material. And they found, uh, they carried this out in eight tumors, uh, five somatotropinomas, one mixed type tumor, and two prolactinomas. And all of them had, um, all of them were null of the active AIP gene. Um, so this all kind of strengthened the notion that uh, predisposition to PA is associated with like prolact prolactinomas and somatotropinomas and AIP likely acted as a suppressor, tumor suppressor. Um, they also looked at uh, familial somatotro uh, somatotropinomas and AIP's role within that. And uh, they looked at they looked at one German, one Turkish familial case. Um, they didn't know, they didn't have the mutation. They also looked at uh, they also looked at two Italian siblings, and they didn't have that AIP mutation, but they did have a uh, exon mutation, um, R300, R304X, so it was a, term, a chain terminating mutation. Um, and they compared it with a bunch of controls um, from the UK and Italy, and this particular mutation was absent. Um, the phenotype in the siblings was similar to the Finnish uh, uh, the Finnish participants. So they had a young age of onset and no visible evidence of dominant transmission. Um, so cumulatively, all of this indicates that individuals with PAP have a strong, uh, they're strongly associated to have a loss of function mutation in the AIP gene. A little bit about AIP is that it um, forms a complex with the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, which um, and along with two heat shock proteins, it has implications in metabolizing the hep B virus um, X protein. And then interestingly, interestingly enough, the R340X mutation um, actually removes this AHR binding region. So where AIP can't associate with aryl hydrocarbon receptor. Um, 
And so AHR is actually a ligand activated transcription factor. It overlooks metabolism of a lot of microbial enzymes. It also uh, involved in numerous intracellular signaling pathways. Um, and AIP prevents um, AHR from reaching the nucleus. Um, so it keeps it in the cytoplasm. And AIP is involved in like camp sig signaling as well. So um, until this uh, paper, there wasn't a lot of uh, tumor, a, a lot of literature looking into AIP tumor suppressive biology, um, which, you know, if we did so, we could find re uh, key cellular processes that could be potential drug targets. Um, but since then, there has been an expansion in literature talking about those things. And uh, I just wanted to highlight there was a recently a, a, a Nature article published in, in September, and it talks about like tissue specific effects of AIP. So it could potentially be a tumor suppressor in colorectal cancer, but an oncogene in B cell lymphoma. So I just appreciating the fact how much uh, literature has changed since 2006. That's when this page paper was published. So before this study, also, there was no genetic predisposition um, in regard to PA talked about a lot in literature, um, which is considering genetically predisposed individuals accounted for a significant portion of these cases. But furthermore, this study also gives molecular tools for identification of predisposed individuals. Um, uh, it helps to attenuate delayed diagnosis um, leading to substantial morbidity. And that is all. Oh, sorry, I did not go to that last slide, but I did talk about it, but yeah. No worries, thank you so much. So Dr. Aggie, what are your thoughts on this article? Oh yeah, this is um, definitely um, one of the more, I, I think in my experience, one of, two scientific studies uh, of, of this that were very landmark studies. They're, they're a little old. So one is this study, and there's also a New England Journal paper, um, uh, I believe from a Dutch group, which was really cool where they found like a family from like centuries ago um, that had a historical archives and uh, familial gigantism and also AIP. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, Broadly speaking, this is not necessarily something that um, impacts day-to-day -day surgical practice because of how rare it is, but it is definitely of interest. Um, familial, or the, the term I guess is FIPA or familial isolated pituitary adenoma, which is the syndromes where you just get pituitary adenomas. Um, so you, now you're excluding MEN or Carney syndrome. Um, and the FIPA represents about 2% of pituitary adenomas. Um, Although, uh, in, and so the, the, the sort of unbiased studies that have shown that it represents 2% of pituitary adenomas are interesting in the sense that if you're in practice long enough, you're going to remove, you know, hundreds or even eventually thousands of pituitary adenomas. And, you know, there's a good chance that um, uh, some of our patients, when you're in practice long enough, uh, may be unknowing, unknown to you or the patient have a, an FIPA. Um, because of the incomplete penetrance and, you know, the fact that pituitary tumors are very common in general, it, you know, sometimes they may have a relative who has one and gets treated and they don't really make much of it. Um, I, uh, our practice as a group, when we have uh, an, another first degree relative of one of our patients who has, uh, who gets diagnosed with an adenoma, as long as the two patients are less than age 40 when they're which is we will refer them for genetic testing are uh, you know most of the FIPA cases are younger than the average pituitary adenoma patient um and so having two patients in their mid 60s get diagnosed and who are relatives is not is felt to be coincidence um uh, also it should be mentioned that most of the familial cases are um uh, endocrine active. So non-functional adenomas really make up only about 10% of the um, FIPA cases, um, a little uh, less in the AIP, AIP muted, mutated ones, uh, but around 10% overall in FIPA cases. Um, so you really, what you're really looking for is, you know, two relatives who are young and both get you know, typically acromegaly or prolactinoma, and that's going to stand out to you, you know, as a surgeon as very unusual when that happens. So, um, but I think it's interesting. I mean, it does go to show 
how challenging it is to um, uh, just understand the biology of pituitary tumors because this gene is clearly a tumor suppressor gene, but it's really only involved in a small portion of the adenomas that we take out every day. Um, so pituitary adenomas, unlike meningiomas, are probably, at least molecularly, a really heterogeneous disease uh, with a bunch of mutations all converging on, on something that looks the same under the microscope, and we don't really have a good understanding of it yet. Well, thank you for those insights, Dr. Augie, and thank you, Immaculate and Martha, for that wonderful presentation. I'm now going to pass it along to Collins and Romina, if you could share your screen. Uh, Get started. Yes. Uh, hello, Dr. Uh, Manish Aggie and uh, Romina. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Let me go ahead and share the screen. Uh, can you see it? Yes, we could also see your notes if you don't mind making it full screen. I actually made it full screen just a moment. Sure. Okay, one moment, please. And while we're waiting on that, feel free to use the Q&A function. If you have questions during these, we can definitely answer them towards the end of each presentation. How about now, can you see the, um, my presentation? Not yet. Okay, interesting. One moment. And how about now? Nothing still. We could see it before, it's just that we could also see your notes. So it wasn't entirely full screen. Okay, interesting. I'm so sorry for inconvenience. No worries. If you want, I could also share the screen and, and share your presentation. Um, well, um, I let think me that, could be a, that could be that an option if you uh, share the screen screen and maybe uh, we use our own um, PowerPoint is this a case? Uh, yes, um, of course, in just a moment. Sure. Okay, and uh, how about now? We can see a little bit of it as well as your notes again. Okay. So, you know what, I can share screen here and uh, just tell me when to advance the slide and that's perfectly fine. That way you could also see your notes. Well, fantastic, that would be amazing. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. No problem. Uh, could you just stop sharing the screen and then I'll proceed with yep. that. Thank yes, you. So I believe it was this one, right? Uh, yes. Okay. All right, go for it. Well, thank you so much. Um, just a moment. Uh, well, basically, we're in the first slides. I would like to introduce myself quickly. Um, I'm a Collins Hart. I'm a medical doctor candidate, fourth of six year medical students from Finland at University of Medicine, Pharmacy of Craiova. I'm a former molecular biotechnology bachelor's and master's degree student at University of Helsinki in Finland for biomedical science, business, piano performance degree students at the University of South Alabama, United States of America, for a molecular neurology research assistant at the University of Helsinki Biomedical in Finland, a clinical neuroscience research assistant for professor of Dr. Wagner at my medical school and neurosurgeon's assistant at the University of Emergency Clinic Hospital of Craiova, uh, previously completed a rotation in neurology 
at University of Health at the Central Hospital in Finland and previously completed a uh, neurological rotation also at Espo City Hospital in Finland and internal medicine rotation at Selepavara Espo Health Clinic in Finland. I'm a member of Congress of Neurological Surgeons as a medical student and I'm a Finland national team champion in foreign hurdles with a personal record of 51.3 and I'm a former classical concert uh, pianist and it was of second place in 2008 Alabama State Piano Competition in the United States of America and a former classical concert pianist student at Lahti Conservatory in Finland and a former classical concert pianist student at uh, Piotr Lewis Tchaikovsky uh, Conservatory in Moscow, Russian Federation. And uh, uh, Romina, would you please introduce yourself? Hello, good evening, everyone. I'm Romina Arias Uribe. And um, it's a pleasure to be here for the opportunity to present uh, in the Urinal Club. So I'm also an MD candidate. Uh, I attend St. George's University School of Medicine. And right now in my fourth year, I'm actually in my neurology rotation in St. Michael's Hospital in New Jersey. So just a little bit uh, quick uh, background. So before med school, I was an adjunct professor at two community colleges in New Jersey. I was also a research assistant at three institutions, and I'm a, I have, I'm a member of a couple of associations related to neurology and neurosurgery. And yeah, that's pretty much some of, um, a little bit of myself and my background. Um, and you can continue, Collins, uh, with your presentation. Well, thank you so much. Uh, if you could go to the first uh, page, or to the second slides of the abstract. Is it not showing right now? Um, just a moment. I, for some reason, well, um, if you are in, um, I can see my presentation, but if, if you are in object slides, I can yep. just go ahead. Yes. I'm, I'm an abstract. If anybody can't see it, just let me know in the QA. Yes. So basically, um, um, the abstract, um, in conclusion, um, as far as object is concerned, future adenomas are fairly common in intracranial neuroplasm and non functioning ones constitute a large subgroup of these adenomas. And of course, complete uh, resection of often difficult and may pose um, undue risk to neurological and, and the chronic uh, function. And stereotactic radio surgery has come to play an important role in, uh, in the management of the patient with uh, non-functioning pituitary adenomas. Uh, this study examines uh, the outcome after radio surgery in large multicenter patients population. And of course, as far as the methods are concerned under the Auspice of the North American Gamma Knife uh, Consortium. Nine Gamma Knife uh, Surgery Centers uh, retrospectively combined their outcome data obtained in 512 patients with a non functional uh, pituitary adenomas. Uh, prior resection was performed in 479 patients, and prior uh, fractionated external beam radiotherapy was performed in 34 patients. And of course, the median age of the time of the radio surgery was 53 years and 58% of the patient had some degree of hypopituitarism prior to radio surgery, and patient received a median dose of 16 uh, grade to the tumor margin. Uh, the median follow-up was 36 uh, month. And if you could go to the second slide, please. And as far as the results are concerned, overall tumor control was achieved in 93% uh, of patients at last follow-up and actually tumor control was 98%, 95, 91, and 85 at three, five, eight, and 10 years plus radio surgery respectively. And of course, smaller adenoma volume and absence of uh, supracellular extension were associated with the progressive free tumor surgery and uh, survival, a new or worsened hypopituitarism after reduced surgery was noted in 21% of patients with a thyroid and a cortical, a cortisol uh, deficiencies reported as the most common post-radio surgery endocrinopathies and history of prior radiation therapy and greater tumor margin doses were predictive of new or worsening endocrinopathy after uh, gamma knife surgery, and of course, new or progressive cranial nerve uh, deficits were noted in 9% of patients, and 6% 6 6 of patients had worsening or new onset optic nerve dysfunction. In multivariate analysis, uh, decreasing age, increasing volume, and the history of prior radiation therapy and history of prior pituitary axis deficiency were uh, predictive of new or worsening cranial nerve uh, dysfunction. 
uh, no patient died as a result of a tumor progression and a favorable outcome of uh, tumor uh, control. And of course, neurological present, uh, preservation were reflected in the four point radiosurgical pituitary score. And uh, conclusion uh, gamma knife surgery is effective and uh, well tolerated management uh, strategy for the vast majority of the patient with a recurrent of residual uh, non functional pituitary adenomas and delayed. Uh, Hypothyroidism is the most common uh, complication after radiosurgery, and, and neurological and cranial nerve uh, function were preserved on more than 90% of the patient after radiosurgery, and the radiosurgical literature score may predict outcome for future patients who undergo uh, gamma nerve surgery for non-functioning adenoma. And Romina, could you please continue? Okay, so this is my part. So I'm gonna be explaining a little bit more about methods, more in details. So for patient selection, um, this study actually um, recruited nine medical centers and these all medical centers receive an internal review board approvals. The medical centers that participated in the study uh, were the University of Pittsburgh, for example, uh, they recruited 125 patients. University of Kentucky with 49 patients, uh, Cleveland Clinic with 37 patients, University of Sherbrooke, 38 patients, University of Pennsylvania, 21 patients, Yale University with 39, University of California, 47 patients, New York University, 16 patients, and the University of Virginia recruited 140 patients. So that made a total of 512 patients that were recruited for, for this study. Uh, from those uh, 512 uh, patients, 50, uh, close to 56% were uh, male, 44% were females, and the mean age was 53.1%. And most of these patients, uh, about 94% had a previous uh, resection of pituitary adenoma. Uh, a minority of these patients, about 6.6%, uh, had a prior ra uh, radiation therapy for pituitary adenoma. And 58% of the recruited patients had some degree of hypothyroidism uh, prior to ra radio surgery. So uh, the median follow-up period was of 36 months for uh, imaging and clinical outcomes. For clinical material, uh, about, as I said, 40, uh, 94 of them, um, I mean, sorry, 94% of them had a prior resection with a histological confirmation of the tumor. That actually made a huge difference because since they were already diagnosed with uh, pituitary adenoma and they have a histological confirmation of the tumor, it makes a little bit easier for the group of the study um, to diagnose and proceed with the, with the evaluation of these patients. Uh, for those without a histological diagnosis, uh, these patients are underwent um, neuroendocrine assessments, also MRI or and CT scan. So depending on the location of the center, if the MRI uh, was not feasible or the MRI was not available or anything that prevented these patients from having MRIs, they were getting CT scans. Also, they underwent clinical examinations to classify them as having a non-functioning uh, pituitary adenoma since they, they didn't have a histological um, confirmation. Uh, also, all the patients uh, were followed up by clinical and neuroendocrine evaluations. Also, cranial nerve uh, evaluations were done in these patients. So for the radiosurgical procedure, they use models UBC4C or perfection gamma knife units, or also they call it electa AV. Those uh, were utilizing all of these centers. Um, they also use local anesthetics supplemented by uh, intravenous uh, conscious sedation as needed in these patients. After the sedation, um, they use a high resolution stereotactic MRI uh, were performed in these patients. In some cases, as I said before, where the MRI was not feasible or they were not doing MRIs for any reasons, uh, the CT scans uh, were used as an, as an option, as an alternative. And these images were all uh, done under uh, IV contracts. Uh, for those planning, uh, they, uh, those plannings were done under the consultation of a neurosurgeon, 
a radiation oncologist and also the medical physicists um, in, in all of these centers. The maximum dose uh, vary from 10 to 70 gray uh, with a median of 32 gray. And uh, as I said, the dose selection was based on history of prior, uh, prior fractionated radiation therapy exposure, contiguity of the optic apparatus and complex interaction of the tumor volume. Can you please go to the next slide? Okay, uh, still in methods for the evaluation criteria. Uh, basically, uh, the follow-up intervals were about for six months during the first and the second year after the radio surgery. Uh, they were also conducting follow-up in intervals every one or two years in patients with non-neurological findings or tumor growth control. And or, the patients also underwent uh, endocrine testing and neuroimaging. Uh, for follow-up images, um, they were compared with those obtained previously in gamma knife surgery to assess the tumor volume and growth. And for tumor dimensions, um, these dimensions were measured uh, in the ex uh, axial, sagittal, and coronal planes. For a statistical analysis, they, they use a bunch of different tests depending on what they, who they wanted to measure. And I put some examples from the article here. So they use height square tests, Fisher exact tests, and mental Hensel tests for linear association of categorical values, for example. Uh, and pair student uh, t-tests with Levin tests were used for statistics of means. And the Wilkinson rank sum test was used uh, when variables were not normally distributed. For survival and progression free survival, Kaplan Meyer curves were plotted, and those include uh, dates of the first uh, stereotactic radio surgery, that's SRS, stands for stereotactic radio surgery follow-up MRI sessions and death in the last follow-up, they were all included in the, in the Kaplan-Meyer curves. For Cox re, uh, regression analysis, they were used uh, to assess hazard ratios for factors predict uh, predictive of tumor progression. And logis uh, logistic reg uh, regression analysis was also used to assess predictors of unfavorable outcomes. And the last one was uh, stat software was used for a statistical analysis. You can go with the next one. You have about three minutes. That's calling. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, so I quickly would like to cover um, the results. Uh, basically, as you can see in the table three, uh, as far as the tumor response is concerned, we have a complication after surtactic radio surgery, and we have a, the median follow-up after gamma knife surgery was three six months, and we can see that's a Almost 50% of patients had a three-year follow-up, uh, almost 40 had a five-year follow-up, and 16 had a seven follow-up. So at last, follow-up 31 of 469 patients had a tumor progression. And as you can see in figure one, uh, basically we have a progression-free survival after gamma knife surgery for a cohort of 520, 512 patients with a non-functioning pituitary adenomas. And you can see that at three years, um, um, which is at 36 months, we can see that the post register surgery um, led to 98% of patients had a progressive free survival. And uh, at five years, uh, 60 month uh, post register surgery, 95% of patients had a progressive free survival. And of course, at eight years, 96 month uh, post register surgery led to 91% of patients had progressive free su survival. And at 10 years, 120 month, uh, post uh, register surgery leads to 85% of um, patients ha uh, had a progression free survival. And as figure two, as you can see, we can quickly tell the progressive free survival after gamma knife surgery for those undergoing upfront uh, compared with the uh, savage surgery surgery, uh, there was no significant difference in the progression of free survival in patients with some upfront surgery surgery versus patients with spiral resection. And quickly, as I say in the table four, as you can see, uh, there is a factor predictive of tumor progression. And of course, we have inverted analysis where uh, history of radiation, hypothyroidism, decreasing margin dose, um, et cetera, et cetera. And we have a multivariate analysis volume was a strong predictor of a tumor progression that it removed all other uh, 
uh, covariances. And after controlling uh, for volume, there was a trend for patient with a supercellular extension to have tumor progression. And of course, in the most important in figure three, as you can see here, um, uh, progression-free survival after gamma knife surgery as function of adenoma volume, uh, we can tell it was a significant predictor of tumor progression when broken down between patients with a lesion uh, that's where five cent uh, cubic centimeters or less versus lesions larger than five cubic centimeters, as you can see here. And of course, quickly in figure five, progression-free survival after gamma knife surgery as a function of uh, presence of absence of uh, supracellular extension of uh, the pituitary adenoma. Uh, we can tell that a patient having supracellular extension uh, also had an increased risk of tumor uh, progression. Basically, supracellular extension, tumor ex extension above the cellar Dorsica and um, uh, would you go please to the next slide of the results? I quickly cover it. Yep. Thank you so much. Yes. And as you can see um, here, we have a figure five, uh, which is um, basically a progression free survival after the surgery as a function of margin dose. Well, this is very important because now we have a 16 grace versus. Uh, less than 60 grays. So median dose used uh, in this series, as you can see, is a 16 grays. However, patients treated with 16 grays or more were less likely to demonstrate tumor progression. And that's the focus idea of the study. And of course, as you can see in figure six, we have 26%. Um, it's quite large uh, of patients receiving less than 12 grays now. And then we had a uh, 4.5% of patients receiving more than 12 grays, 12 to 20 grays, uh, had a tumor progression as well. And um, however, it's way less uh, than um, originally. And 8% of patients receiving more than 20 grays had a tumor progression as well. So uh, in conclusions, um, as concluded in figure five in the previous uh, figure, patients treated with 16 grays or more were less likely to demonstrate tumor progression. And as far as the clinical um, response is concerned, as you can see in table five here, uh, factors are, um, uh, uh, predictive of new or worsening cranial nerve uh, dysfunction after gamma night knife surgery in multivariate analysis, especially where large tumor volumes, history of prior um, uh, hypoteritism, history of prior radiation therapy, and younger age were more likely to have cranial nerve deficit after stereotactic surgery. As we can see here, we can also have the percentage, for example, as 12% of 33 patients receiving less than 12 grays had new or worsening cranial nerve cranial function. And then percentage decreased 8.9% uh, of patients receiving 12 to 20 grace had new or worsening cranial nerve uh, uh, dysfunction. Of course, then the same presents 8.8% of patients receiving more than 20 uh, grays had new or worsening cranial nerve uh, dysfunction. And quickly, uh, as far as uh, endocrine response concerned in table six, as we can see a predictor of new or worsening pituitary dysfunction, um, univariate analysis of new or worsening endocrine deficit in order to increase frequency were used as follows. Um, diabetes insipidus were included, canandotropin, growth hormone, cortisol, thyroid hormones, and when, and when comparing patient with and without preoperative endocrine deficits, patient with preoperative endocrine deficits were more likely not to develop uh, additional post gamma knife surgery deficits and in multivariate analysis, increasing margin dose um, and history of prior radiotherapy were predictive of either new or worsening pituitary dysfunction and patients with new or worsening cranial nerve dysfunction were also more likely to have new or worsening pituitary dysfunction after the therapy. And last, uh, as you can see, as far as the proposed feature chat genoma or the surgery grading system is concerned, which is quite important, as you can see in figure seven, uh, registered feature score favorable regis regis surgical outcome was defined as number tumor growth and pres preservation of neurological function. 88% uh, of patients achieved a favorable regis surgery outcome at last follow-up. And of course, factors that were statistically related to the favorable outcome were 
eight, older than 50 years, two more volume, less than five cubic centimeters, and no prior radio radiotherapy. And quickly, as, as it's mentioned here, radiosurgical pituitary score was delayed based on the multivariate modeling. So the score was as follows, 1.4, over the 50 years old, 0.4 less than 50 years old, and tumor volume 1.4 tumor volume less than five cubic centimeters, and 0.4 tumor volume more than five cubic centimeters, and uh, prior radiation at uh, two points for uh, no previous uh, radiation and 0.4 uh, prior radiation. So favorable outcome for the radio surgical picture score were as as follows: uh, RPS of four had a favorable outcome of 95% and uh, radiosurgical pituitary score of two had favorable outcome of 67% as you can see here and radiosurgical, um, radi radiosurgical pituitary score of one had a favorable um, score of um, um, had a favorable score of 50% and um, lastly uh, radiosurgical pituitary score of zero had a favorable uh, score of 20%. So the higher is the associated score uh, it is basically associated with a better outcome. And uh, Romina, you can continue. Sorry, I don't mean to cut this short, but we really are running out of time here. So if you're able to try to summarize these slides in just a sentence, if possible, I know there's a lot here. Um, yeah, I could go to that conclusion, basically, uh, just to, you could go to the next one. So, you. yeah, sure. So basically the conclusion of this study was uh, the gamma knife surgery provided a high rate of local tumor control and low risk of collateral neurological cranial nerve and endocrine access injury for patients with non-functioning pituitary adenomas. Uh, yes, and that was just the reference. And just to conclude, uh, it was basically uh, a, be a better type of surgery than the previous radio surgery that was used before. All right, any thoughts, Dr. Augie? Yeah, this is a, a study I'm very familiar with, and I, I enjoy reading multi-center studies because um, uh, you really get the benefit of seeing, you know, d dozens of centers experience pooled together rather than, you know, single center studies, which tend to come from large institutions uh, whose practices may be similar to my own. And so uh, the things that stood out to me from this um, and that are in some ways different than my own practice, um, make what make of it what you will, is uh, I was, you know, it's a small number, but the, the, there were 33 patients who went straight to Gamma Knife without any prior surgery. And that's yes. just unheard of in my practice. Um, and, uh, you know, by definition, if the adenoma is large enough that you're considering treating it, it's usually a macroadenoma, not a microadenoma for the non-functionals. And to not operate and go to radiosurgery um, for 33 of those cases is definitely not the way I practice. Even in older patients, the surgery is very safe. Um, I, I have actually seen some cases presented from not necessarily authors who participated in the study, but authors who do radiosurgery and, and showed me, you know, 1.1 centimeter tumor that they did gamma knife on and, and it worked fine, but I, I just, it's not the way I would typically practice. And certainly if I were the patient, it's not what I would pursue. Um, but uh, I also think those cases were caught in my eye, but there's so few of them that it's hard to make yes. any statistical impression. So they have that Kaplan-Meier curve and you know, there's a hint that the 33 were progressing quicker, but it wasn't statistically significant, and and that could be a sample size issue. So that was one thing that caught my eye. Um, the authors draw a lot of attention on the. It's it's weird because they don't they kind of gloss over that, and then mm -hmm. what they do sort of draw attention to the fact that 41 percent of the patients had two prior surgeries, which to me is not that surprising because a lot of times we'll you know, if it, you may not radiate right away and then it grows back and you do a second surgery and then you radiate. Um, but I, I, I think there was a degree to which the folks who wrote the study were really on the side of radiation. And I think that, you know, surgery when it's done effectively by experienced teams um, can reduce the need for radiation. And it's important to keep that in mind. And, you know, where you see this most strikingly is the side effects. So, you know, the 93% control rate is great. 21% um, hypopituitarism, 
I, I, that's about what I quote patients. So that's not too bad. But the cranial neuropathies, uh, 9% cranial nerve deficits, that's really, you know, that's not something I get at. And, and the way you avoid that is by only radiating when you can make sure you're giving the optic nerve like a dose of six gray. And they don't even mention the optic nerve dose. And so um, I, I think that's the real, basically the two things in the, that were done here. And obviously this is a, not the, somebody contributed cases to this where they didn't operate in 33 of them, or they gave too high a dose to the optic nerve. And I think that really should have been spelled out as, you know, a, a cautionary tale. And, yes. um, but other than that, I mean, it's a very valuable tool. Um, and it's, you know, we typically will monitor the dose we give the optic nerve and the dose we give the stalk, um, yes. because that's really what determines hypopituitarism more than the dose you give the gland. And as long as those two numbers are low, then we proceed with single fraction gamma knife like they described. But if those doses get high, then we do fractionate them into three or five fractions. And um, that's really, um, and I think this is an important paper because we don't learn as much about radiation in school or residency, but it's an important part of, it's an important thing to know about for neurosurgeons. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Mihaly, uh, for your uh, feedback. Thank you so much. And thank you, Romina, for for collaboration. Thank you, everyone. Thank you both. And yeah, this is a last resort type situation when we're using radiation, um, at least in terms of what Dr. Fernandez Miranda and Dr. Sanusi were telling us. So it's a very interesting paper. Thank you for your presentations. All right, um, we're looking forward to presenting uh, our next presenters. Feel free to share your screen and get started. Yes, um, hi, give me a second. Stand this up. Can everyone see my screen? Looks perfect. Awesome. And awesome. Okay, hi. Hey, um, I'm just gonna let Umar go ahead and um, introduce himself for us before I go start. Okay. Hi guys, uh, my name is Omar. I'm a second year medical student at the University of Oklahoma and really excited to be here and presenting uh, this paper. Yeah, hi, um, Collins, do you mind muting yourself, please? Of course, just a moment. Thank you. Um, my name is Ajibola Bakari. I go by Aji. I am a second year student here at Tulane University School of Medicine. And tonight, um, thanks for bearing with us. We're going to try to be as quickly as possible. Um, we're going to be talking about this paper. It's titled Endoscopic versus Microscopic Transphenoidal Surgery in the Treatment of Pituitary Adenoma. And this is just a systemic review and meta analysis paper. Um, so just to kind of in a way of introduction and just to kind of orient everyone. Um, so I, I'm sure we've all heard about the pituitary gland. We've talked about it a lot today. And so it's just a small um, pea-sized um, organ that basically sits above the nasal um, passage and just beneath the optic nerve. And it sits in the cell tossica. And as we all know, the pituitary gland performs a lot of function. It basically serves as a conduit between the brain and the endocrine system. And it produces a lot of different hormones that regulate vital processes. And so based on the location, we can easily see, I think we can all appreciate that, you know, when we have a, a sort of tumor in this gland, um, you can see how like due to mass effects, um, it can cause problems in surrounding structures or even like overproduce some of the hormones that it usually produces. And so pituitary adenoma is mostly benign tumor. Um, it doesn't, you know, spread around, but in even though it's benign, it does like cause a lot of problem. And it accounts for about 10% of um, all primary intracranial tumors. Um, while there are medications available to help um, with this, um, tumor. The adenomas, um, unfortunately, they have some undesirable side effects for patients. And so usually surgery is a good treatment for this. And one of the best approaches that um, have been available for decades has been the transphenoidal surgery that has been used to remove these sort of tumors. And there are two different surgical techniques that have been used previously. Um, the gold standard used to be the microscopic transphenoidal approach, but um, with the 
you know, advent of endoscopic surgeries, um, more and more um, surgeons are starting to use the endoscopic transvenoidal surgery approach. Um, so this has become more, this has become more popular in the past decades. Um, but there's been a lot of controversies over the benefits and risk associated with both of these approaches. And this is one of the things that this papers, um, the researchers in these papers wanted to dive into. Okay, so um, this paper was essentially like, uh, as you said, a systematic review and meta-analysis. Meta so um, all of them have to follow like a Prisma uh, a statement and this one followed the Prisma statement published in 2009. Um, ultimately, the goal for the authors here was to truly assess the efficacy and safety uh, when comparing like endoscopic versus like microscopic transvenoidal surgery. Um, the paper was published, I think, in 2017, but the search was run all the way up until like August 2016. Um, and one of the things that, that I took from the method that was truly interesting is that the authors in this paper reached out to like uh, some of the pri uh, primary investigators of the selected studies to inquire about unpublished results or other results that had not made the paper in order to kind of gather and have a, a, a whole view uh, when trying to compare both of these surgeries. Next. Uh, so kind of like, so what were they, what were they looking for? Um, initially, they screened about 410 papers, uh, 360 were taken away. They only reviewed 46, they ended up including 23 studies in the meta-analysis. Uh, the inclusion criteria for this paper was uh, again, efficacy and safety comparison of endoscopic uh, against microscopic surgeries. And each of these papers that was included had to have some kind of comparison, uh, comparing both of those. And also every patient, including in those papers, had to have at least one of the most relevant outcome reported. And what those outcome were, were essentially uh, gross total reductions, uh, cerebrospinal fluid leak, diabetes, insipidus, and, and et cetera. And um, all of the data that was retrieved was actually collected by two independent investigators and reviewed by a third investigator. Um, in this paper, the authors were, were truly trying to get, uh, uh, were truly trying to uh, make sure that like, there were no bias and, and all of the studies were really checked out. So they, they went ahead and, and did a whole bunch of statistical analysis. They calculated odds ratio, 95 um, confidence interval, fixed and random effect model, but only reported the random effect. Um, there was skewed statistics done to, to make sure that all the studies included were, were heterogeneic, uh, were significantly heterogeneic, and there was chi-square done with uh, p-values calculated to make sure that each of these subgroup that analysis were, were, were conducted on were also um, heterogeneic. And at the end, they did an eager and back test to make sure that uh, and evaluate uh, every uh, paper that was included uh, to remove any kind of publication bias. Okay, so here I'm just going to show you some of the results that they had. So the first thing they wanted to do, um, so like I said, they have the endoscopic, which is the more the newer one, and then you have like the microscopic transvenidal um, approach. Um, so I'm just going to refer to them as ETSS and NTSS from now on. Um, so the first thing they wanted to see was to see like the gross tumor removal um, between the two approaches. And what they noticed was overall, when they looked at all of the 23 different papers, only um, I believe um, 21 of the papers actually reported this. Um, and what they saw was that overall, when they looked at the odds ratio, um, sorry, 18 of the studies, right? When they looked at the overall odds ratio, they actually saw that the ETSS had like a higher, it was about 52% higher um, gross tumor removal compared to the NTSS. And so that was a positive thing. Um, but one of the things that they also did um, that Umar um, alluded to is that they did some statistics to make sure there was not a lot of heterogeneity between your studies. And what they found was that there are some heterogeneity between like publications um, after 2010. And like you can see in this table to the right, you can see that the, there's the p-value right here. Um, there's a little bit of heterogeneity um, between the subgroups. And then they looked at like between countries also of the um, publications and they saw that outside of the US, there was also a little bit of heterogeneity in some of the data that they, they published. They did some other analysis, some sensitivity analysis, just to make sure that um, if they um, sequentially removed some of the data set that um, the 
whatever conclusion they came to was not going to be affected and there was no significant difference when they did um, the sensitivity analysis um so all of the sensitivity analysis done in this study was not significantly different um so that was the first thing they did and they wanted to see in terms of complications are there any um, associated complications to the etss relative to the mcss so the first thing they looked at was the csf leaks and what they saw was that they actually didn't really see um, any significant difference between the two groups um, when they looked at CSF leaks from different publications. Um, and they did the same thing like I discussed, they always did the heterogeneity data. Um, unlike the G, um, GTF, um, um, the gross tumor removal GTR rather, um, they didn't see heterogeneity between the publications and there was no significant difference in sensitivity as well. And then they looked at diabetes insipidus, which is another complication that could result from these surgeries. And again, what they did see here was that when they looked at the overall data, they saw that the summary of the odds ratio showed a 22% reduction in the risk of diabetes insipidus in the ETSS group relative to the NTSS group. Um, but um, even though there was a reduction, this was not statistically significant. And um, so this was kind of interesting. So potentially um, maybe having more data could have helped with that. Um, so the final thing they wanted to do was to just look at other complications um, that are usually associated with um, these two surgeries. And so um, the, the biggest um, difference that they saw was in septal perforation. And so when they looked at the overall result, they also saw that there was like a associated lower risk of septal perforation in the ETSS relative to the MTSS group. Um, and this was actually significant. Um, so um, they looked at the other complications and they actually didn't see any significant differences in the other um, complications that they looked at. And finally, they wanted to see if there was any sort of bias in their publication. And so they did the funnel plot and um, this is what you see here. And um, they saw that overall, there was no um, significant difference between like any of the data set and there was no like there was no indication for bias in their publication. Um, so for the discussion, so again, kind of like coming going back to the uh, initial point of this uh, of this paper is that there was very few evidence based innovation guidelines comparing uh, endoscopic versus microscopic treatment. Um, so what was the outcome of this study? Well, essentially the authors found out that the endoscopic surgery actually showed beneficial effect on gross total reduction. Um, and the same effect was kind of reported in other studies. There was one that mentioned that uh, the one-year gross total reduction was 74% overall in uh, endoscopic versus 50% in microscopic. Um, endoscopic surgery seems to, be, seems to give a better rate of disease control and also were preferred for adenomas with supercellular um, extension. Um, the other thing, like I just mentioned, and I think was the most significant result they found, was that the endoscopic surgery showed a reduced risk of septal perforation. Um, it's important to note that like none of the articles or none of the trials that were included in the papers actually reported a significant difference, but the authors believe that the, the ultimate, ultimately the large sample size that they have and the extensive uh, quantitative, quantitative evaluation that it did was able to give them that significant reporting. And overall, I think they had uh, over 2000 uh, patients included in this meta-analysis. Um, in the discussion, they also mentioned some of the, um, I guess, some of the reported uh, risk of endo, uh, endoscopic surgeries that, we, according to them, could be criticized. Um, one of the papers that they use, uh, one of the papers that they, that they talked about only used um, eight studies, uh, on, use a variety of sources, and only eight of those actually directly compared endoscopic versus microscopic surgeries. And a 2014 meta-analysis who had a similar result lacked a lot of stratified analysis, and some of the data extracted were actually inconsistent with the original studies. Um, so in summary, the, the results for complications were not significant with type of surgeries, and reason for that is it could be due to the role of different tumor type um, in, in treatment effects, um, and the fact that the patient included in this study had different statuses. 
Um, one other reason why they, they reported that they probably didn't find any, any other significant result was the fact that there was a very variation in degree of follow-up between all across all the different studies, which could have played a, a kind of like a confounding uh, factor. Yeah, so although there are a lot of merits to like this meta analysis, because you know they were able to pull together so many data um, from different um, studies. Um, one of the things, as um, Umar had mentioned, was that um, a lot of this um, the the research that they used in these studies were from retrospective studies. And there were just very few prospective studies, and a lot of them also didn't follow their patients for a long time. And so um, for the future, you know, having a large scale randomized control trial to compare the efficacy and safety profiles of these two surgical approaches um, in the treatment of pituitary adenomas would be very valuable. Um, and thank you very much. These are our references. Um, we'll take questions too. Amazing job. Um, anything you'd like to add, Dr. Agi? No, I, you know, I think this was a um, area of active debate back in 2017. Um, but as with a lot of things, it, it sort of works itself out. And, you know, if you look at five years later, it, it, the debate has simmered down a lot because, you know, endoscopic surgery is, is really the way that most uh, residents are being trained these days. And so the the number of microscopic surgeons now is is really dropped quite a bit, um, and and training is really how things propagate or fail to propagate over time. And the reality is most of the microscopic surgeons are, you know, that's what the pr procedure they're comfortable with, and and they're very good at it. But you know, that many of them would also acknowledge that if they were training now, they would certainly be doing endoscopic surgery. Um, and I think the, the advantages in terms of visibility um, and your ability to achieve a GTR, as the speakers mentioned, and do it without sort of trauma to the septum are all, you know, really there. I think the key is, you know, the, the old saying, of, you know, a, a fool with a tool is still a fool. I mean, you have to ultimately have the skill set that's needed um, uh, and that these are just you know, techniques, but it's your experience and your comfort that, you know, define who you are. When I, I, when I trained purely with microscopic, but I took courses to learn endoscopic. My first year or two, I was doing a little bit of both until I, you know, half and half almost in my practice. And then um, once I got fully facile with endoscopic, I stopped doing microscopic cases. But during those two years, I, I kind of would go back and forth just depending on, you know, availability and setup. And, and it was, it was really easy for me to go back and forth. Um, uh, it's, 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 but it's different techniques and different, you know, workflow, but ultimately in some ways doing both for two years helped me get really confident with the anatomy. Cause I just sort of hopped around back and forth and it, it made me think about it a little more, but I think, you know, the, when we were reviewing papers back in 2017, there was a real market for papers like papers like this that helped um, uh, at least attempt to show the microscopic surgeons that the endoscope was as good or maybe even better. Um, but now when we review papers that are presenting microscopic cases, we kind of just say it's outdated. Yeah, and that's a similar sentiment to what our other faculty guests were mentioning in the previous two webinars, so it makes a lot of sense. Do you feel like the endoscopic approach has a better field of view for you, and that's mostly why you're using it then? Yeah, for sure. And then it's a it's a better field of view. No one can deny that. The microscopic surgeons talk about, um, uh, you know, three dimension or depth perception, but um, your endoscope is constantly moving, your hands are constantly moving, and that's what reinforces the depth the depth perception that you would get with a microscope. Um, and even for a small microadenoma, you can really do a delicate micro dissection with an endoscope. So um, you can repair leaks better. And yeah, the septum is I, that for sure. Like of all the things in this paper, I was nowhere near as gentle with the septum with a microscope as I am with an endoscope. And that's a visibility issue as well. Because with a microscope, you're so desperate for improving your field of view that you're just pushing things aside um, to get to, and you're, you're not as respectful of the um, nasal passages.
Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.